Hey, if you have uh, if you have been with us or on Sundays, or if you have been listening for the past several weeks, then you know that we have been celebrating Advent. We have been uh, celebrating the arrival of the kingdom, a, a beautiful kingdom that's worth celebrating as as the kingdom of God breaks into the present age through the through the birth of Jesus. Uh, and as we continue now over these next few weeks, we're going to be continuing to, to look at the gospel of Matthew con to continue to explore what is this kingdom and what does it mean for us? Uh, as Steve talked about last week that, that this kingdom is at the very least surprising, that is unexpected and unconventional. Now, my wife, Elizabeth, and I are um, expecting our third son right now, uh, and I remember the, the anticipation and the, and the arrival of our first two. There were uh, baby registries to fill out, there were diapers to buy, hospital bags to pack, loose ends to tie up, uh, but lots of anticipation. Uh, and then finally, the day came that they, they arrived, and we were, we were overjoyed. Uh, the first moments of getting to hold Gilbert and Coleman in our arms, uh, those are the moments that you take pictures of, that you, that you tell family stories about, that you, you fill photo albums with. Uh, and they're the memories that you continue to share and celebrate each year as their birthday rolls around, this moment of, of celebrating their arrival, that they were finally here. Uh, but then in the next moment, uh, I had another realization, which was, uh, shoot, they are, he, he's here, he's arrived. Uh, code red, the train has left the station. Uh, D-Day has come, the ship has sailed, and there's, there's no way that we're ready for this. I think I've forgotten everything that, it, that babies require, but there's no time to learn he's, because he's already here. Uh, this is real, and it's going to take everything that we've got whether that's becoming parents for the first time or, or the switch from having one to two, uh, this is going to require things. It's going to require skills, heart, uh, and even a level of internal fortitude that I haven't yet developed. Uh, in other words, it's a role that we're going to have to grow into, but it'll be totally worth it. Uh, but there's this moment of realization that came where we had to, we had to buckle up because we had a baby. I think this is kind of how the, the start of Matthew chapter three should hit us. Uh, we rejoice and praise God because the kingdom has come. It's finally here. Uh, but at the same time, there's a realization of what on earth do we need, do we do now? The king has come. The kingdom has arrived. And it's going to take, it's going to require everything that we've got. It's going to demand of us skills and heart and internal fortitude that we haven't yet developed. It's a kingdom that we're going to have to grow into, but it's going to be totally worth it. So, so buckle up. The kingdom as a, is at hand. And this is actually John's message here in the beginning of, of Matthew chapter three. I'm going to read our passage for us. Matthew says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a, a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands, and he will clear his threshing for it, floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So John's message here is, is the kingdom is at hand. Uh, he's come to announce uh, that Jesus has arrived, that Jesus is on the scene, and that he is ushering in the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Uh, so Matthew 3 starts, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. 
Uh, and of course, he couldn't just come in a, in a normal way. The passage tells us that he comes uh, wearing a garment of camel's hair and uh, eat his, he eats uh, locusts and wild honey and lives in the wilderness. Uh, if you haven't been able to tell from the first two, two chapters of Matthew, the arrival of the kingdom has been anything but ordinary. And for a kingdom that starts with a virgin birth in an obscure town that's marked by the stars and features a baby king sleeping in a feeding trough, who better to be the spokesperson for that kingdom than a guy who lives in the wilderness, wears a camel, and eats grasshoppers. But Matthew tells us, as strange as John might seem when we first meet him, uh, this is actually the long-anticipated prophetic voice from the book of Isaiah. He's the, he's the front runner sent by God himself to prepare the way for the arrival of the Messiah. And so Matthew says, this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, when he said the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. This is the prophetic voice that the people of Israel have been waiting for to, to mark the arrival of the kingdom. And the kingdom has arrived. And so John comes with a, with a stirring, sobering, uh, yet watershed moment kind of an announcement here. He says the king, the king is here. Uh, prepare the way of the Lord. And I think even in this uh, short and sweet cut to the heart message, we should start to see a theme that's going to continue to to bloom and blossom through the rest of Matthew's gospel. And that theme is this: that the kingdom always evokes a response. The king's arrival always evokes a response, but that that response ranges from either sheer jubilation uh, to, to absolute terror. Now, I, uh, as a kid, I remember this very distinct sound uh, of being inside the house, especially upstairs in the house, and it was the sound of the garage door opening. And that sound meant one of two things. It either meant dad's home, dad's home. And we, we would run downstairs to go meet him at the garage door. Uh, or if you were sitting in your dirty, not yet cleaned up room that you had been tasked with cleaning, uh, that sound meant, oh crap, dad's home. And these are the two kind of responses that we see continually from, from various characters throughout Matthew's gospel. The kingdom has arrived. Uh, Jesus' ministry has come, and, and through Jesus' ministry, the kingdom's going to be put on full display. Jesus is going to go toe-to-toe with, with the powers that be, with uh, the secret thoughts of men's heart, and even with nature itself, and, and everyone will stand amazed. But some will rejoice, uh, and others will be repulsed. There's, the kingdom elicits a different response from, from people. Uh, but John, so John preaches, announces the coming of the kingdom and says, repent for the kingdom is at hand. But what, is, what does this mean? What does it mean uh, that the kingdom has arrived? The kingdom is already at hand. Uh, well, I think John's going to show us two specific things in this passage that it means. The first thing that he says is that, that, that even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. In other words, the kingdom's arrival is imminent. Verse, verse 10, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So as John confronts the Pharisees, he gives this warning. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. He doesn't say that one day things are going to change. He says that even now, at this very moment, the axe has been laid to the tree. The kingdom's arrival is imminent. It has already begun. In other words, this, this isn't a pipe dream. The kingdom of God is here, and it, it warrants, it demands immediate action from people, from us. Uh, there's no reason to, to waste our life continually looking for the next best thing to come around the corner when the, the only best thing has already arrived. Now, it's true that we, we still await the, the full and final manifestation of the kingdom when Jesus returns. But make no mistake, the kingdom of God is already here. Uh, it's not something worth considering for the future. It is, it is all-consuming, all-satisfying, and it is here now and already worth giving every inch of your life to. I, 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 this, is, this is kind of what I feel like. I feel like um, what the, the picture that John is painting uh, is like the chef has stepped out from the kitchen and he has announced that dinner is served. Uh, and on the table sits an immaculate feast. The table is piled high with rich, savory delicacies. 
And yet, tragically, so many of us still sit in the living room as if we never heard the announcement. Now, some of us are laying on the couch uh, with a bag of M&Ms, and we are, we're getting a quick hit of sugar, but we are ruining our appetite for the feast with every handful. Others of us have, have deceived ourselves into thinking that the remedy to our, to our hunger lies elsewhere. Uh, we've actually tricked ourselves into thinking that the feast is really bad for us. But then there's others, and this, this situation might be the most tragic of all, who, who know the chef, who have heard and seen and smelled the types of things that the chef can cook. And we're sitting around, sitting around chatting with each other, anticipating the meal that's going to come because we know what a great meal is coming. And we're talking about how we're saving room for it. And meanwhile, the feast is sitting on the table. We're licking our chops, dreaming about the, the meal that's to come. Uh, and in turn, we've missed the chef's announcement that dinner is served. It doesn't matter what kind of appetite you are, you are building up if the food is on the table and you're still sitting on the couch. And what an absolute tragedy would it be if the feast were to grow cold and you still had not taken a bite. So it's true, we look ahead. The day of the Lord is coming when heaven and earth will be brought will, will be brought and united under Christ's reign. Christ's perfectly reign will be will be brought to bear over all things. There is a day coming when we will be walk hand in hand with the chef. We will be taken back into the kitchen, uh, and because of that, our our palates will grow and deepen. Our appreciation of the meal will grow even deeper and richer. We're going to discover things about the chef and the ingredients he uses, the ways that he combines those together in meals uh, that will make the taste grow only richer or sweeter. But the truth is that the food is already on the table and even now is worth sinking our teeth into. The psalmist says uh, in Psalm 19, the instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. Life in Christ is sweet. So come take a seat at the table, take a seat with God's people, with his church, and fill up your plate. Pray, read, sing, give, serve, lean into life in Christ. Lose your life and find it. Throw, throw your whole self in, head first, two feet in, all your eggs in this basket. And what you'll find is satisfaction. Because and because the kingdom of God is already at hand, even now the ax is laid at the tree. Uh, so what are we waiting for? So first, the, the, the arrival of the kingdom is imminent. And then second, John tells us that, that Jesus comes with a winnowing fork in his hand. Uh, in other words, the kingdom's arrival elicits a sorting. As John talks about Jesus, the, the even greater one who's to come, he says in verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn. If you've never heard of a winnowing fork before, it's, it's basically a pitchfork, uh, a long rake-like farm instrument uh, that's used to sort the good harvest from the leftovers. So John makes it clear that Jesus arrives on the scene, and he arrives on the scene sorting. Now, all of us sort. Every single one of us sorts, no matter who you are or what belief system you hold, your world is sorted. You have an us box and you have a them box. Now, who you place, what makes someone go in the us box versus the them box can, can vary wildly from person to person. Uh, and even your interpretation of those boxes, are they a good thing or are they a bad thing? Where did they come from? Who decides who goes in what? That might be radically different from the next guy, but all of us have, a, have an us box and a them box. And John's listeners, Jesus's disciples, the Pharisees, they were no different. They also had an us and a them. Uh, maybe us were the Jews, and them were the Gentiles. Maybe us were the socially elite, and them were the masses. Maybe us were the pious, and them were the unclean. But all of them had a way that they sorted the world into us and them. But the question is, if Jesus comes with a winnowing fork in his hand, uh, then what is he going to do with these categories? What is he going to do with the line of distinction between us and them? 
For many, they, lo they looked to Jesus to, to draw that line of distinction in bold, permanent marker. They wanted him to take that barrier between us and them and make it clearer, stronger, and maybe even impenetrable. They looked to Jesus to confirm all of their assumptions about who was in and who was out. Is that you? Like, do you, do you look to Jesus to confirm all of your assumptions? Maybe it is, or, or maybe that's not you. Uh, maybe you actually kind of hate people that are like that. You, you know the type, and that would be just like them to want to see Jesus do that. Uh, but not, not your Jesus. Your God would not exclude people like that, uh, except for maybe the jerks that wanted him to. You love passages like Ephesians 2, where, where Jesus makes the two become one, and he tears down the dividing wall of hostility. You are not about a God who draws a line of distinction. You say, you would say things like, in Jesus, there is no us and them. There is only us. But John is here to burst that bubble. He, he has just announced the arrival of Jesus' king, kingdom, and it comes complete with a winnowing fork. The kingdom does elicit a sorting. So what is Jesus going to do about the line between us and them? If he's not reinforcing it and he's not doing away with it, then what is he doing? The truth is that Jesus will radically redraw the line between us and them. This is going to be a theme through the rest of Matthew's gospel, that the line is redrawn. Whatever your us and them previously were, there are, there are thems who are now brothers and sisters. And there are uses. There are our next door neighbors who look like you, sound like you, vote like you, share all the same hobbies and interests that you do, but who now belong to a completely different kingdom. Because Jesus doesn't sort by us and them. He draws the line right through the middle because Jesus is sorting by wheat and chaff. He is sorting by those who see the arrival of the kingdom and rejoice and those who see the arrival of the kingdom and are repulsed. But either way, Jesus comes sorting, and he is gathering wheat into his barn, uh, gathering wheat from every tribe and tongue and people, which, which makes God's family beautiful. But that also means that, that God's family of wheat now includes people who were once in your them box. And that can make family dinner awkward at times. What does your them box look like? And beyond that, what, what subset of that them box makes you cringe the most? Because I guarantee that in Christ, what, someone who fits into that category is now also considered family. For, for Simon, that family, that, that box would have considered someone like Matthew, his now fellow uh, disciple who was once a tax collector. For someone like Philemon, I'm sure that that box uh, would have included his old uh, runaway slave, who's now brother and fellow church leader, Onesimus. Uh, if you take anything away from this point, I want you to remember two things. There is a line. Jesus ju does draw a line. Uh, but that line is not where you think. It's not where you think, which means that that somewhere along that line, it makes you, it's going to make you really uncomfortable. Where is that? Where is that for you? Where is the point along the line that Jesus is drawing that makes you uncomfortable? Because to really take a seat at the table uh, and enjoy the kingdom that is at hand, uh, at one point or another, you have to embrace your weird cousin. You share DNA. You share the blood of Jesus, and you share a family inheritance uh, with a variety of different people, and with people who are naturally at odds with each other, with someone who never shaves, walks barefoot, and lives completely off the grid, with someone who drives a gas-guzzling SUV and buys tons of single-use plastic. You share a family inheritance with someone who's homeless. Uh, but also with someone who's filthy rich and owns a large corporation, with someone who's currently serving a life sentence in prison. Uh, the kingdom includes teenagers, and it includes elderly people, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, people from around the world. The kingdom of God, the, the family of God, now includes someone uh, that you at one time, and maybe even now still, find repulsive. This is the eye-opening watershed moment when you realize that the kingdom is here. It's beautiful. It's worth heralding and celebrating and cherishing like a newborn baby. But also, like a newborn baby, it means that this isn't a game. Stuff just got real.
The king has come with an ax to the root of the tree and a winnowing fork in hand, and the line in the sand is not where you expected. The kingdom comes like a beautiful melody, but it also comes like an unrelenting tidal wave. It makes demands of you. You conform to it and not the other way around. So what do we do? <clears throat> what is the response to John's message? Well, from the very beginning, John comes preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And all, all of Jerusalem and Judea are going out into the wilderness to hear him preach, and they are responding by confessing their sins. What does it look like for us to respond in confession and repentance? The first thing that I would say is do not presume. This is the mistake made by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. John says, do not presume. Don't say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. What is it that the Pharisees are presuming? They're presuming the line between us and them. They have, they have Abraham as their father. They fit into the us category. They're not Samaritans. They're not Romans. Those guys are the outsiders. So where are you guilty of presuming? What status, other than being covered in the blood of Jesus, are you holding on to for assurance? And, and where is it that you have grown more concerned with us and them than you have with wheat and chaff? Do you have brothers and sisters towards whom your heart has grown cold, maybe even hostile? Are you actually displaying wheat-like qualities, or are you just settling for being part of the right group? Because frankly, confessing repentant hearts, don't presume. So first, don't presume. And then second, I would say embrace this king and his kingdom. As upside down and unexpected as it might be, be ready to embrace this king and this kingdom that John is proclaiming. Those who respond to, to John's announcement with confession and repentance, he has one main takeaway for them. Embrace the greater one who is coming after me. John says in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Those who are coming and being baptized into John, he intends for them to be ready to be baptized into Christ. Those who believe John's announcement and repent should be ready at any moment to leave John and embrace Jesus when he comes on the scene. And we see this happen. We see one of these is, is Andrew, uh, Simon Peter's brother, who leaves John to follow Jesus and, and brings his brother with him. Are you ready to embrace this king and his kingdom, knowing full well that Jesus going, is going to ask uncomfortable things of you? Uh, will you be fully ready to embrace an upside-down, cross-shaped kingdom? Because I think what we'll learn as we continue to walk through Matthew, uh, one thing that's going to be abundantly clear is that this kingdom will continually subvert expectation. It will continually subvert your expectation. Uh, so can we embrace this king and this kingdom, knowing that he, he comes and subverts, not, not confirms our, ex, our assumptions? Because the reality is that, that you're a raw piece of wood with knots and splinters. Uh, we are all helplessly warped pieces of wood. And when we come to embrace Jesus and his kingdom, what we're signing up for uh, is we're signing up to be sanded to be rubbed and chipped away and changed in places that we don't want to be changed, to be uncomfortably shaped and conformed. The end result is beautiful, but, but it's completely out of our jurisdiction. Are you ready to surrender yourself to the craftsman to be standed? Because confessing repentant hearts fully embrace the king and his kingdom, even when, and probably especially when, it subverts their expectation. So don't presume, don't presume, be ready to embrace this king and his kingdom. And then lastly, bear fruit, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. This is what John says in verse eight. He says, don't, don't rest on your presumptions, embrace the kingdom and then bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Uh, this is the, this is the uncomfortable part for those of us who wanted Jesus to wipe away that line of distinction. For those of us who wanted Jesus to just gather us into one big happy us category. The kingdom's at hand and it elicits a sorting and every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. Uh, there's a day coming when Jesus will clear the threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff will be burned. So John says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So take pause, take pause, lest you be pruned like a fruitless tree. Be on guard, lest you be sorted and burned with the leftovers after the wheat, the, the good fruit, has been harvested. John is not preaching a message of cheap confession here. 
He is preaching repentance. He's preaching a wholehearted turn from our sin, a costly death to our former selves, and a no-holds-barred embrace of the kingdom. And this type of weighty repentance produces real change. It produces righteousness. For some reason, it, it feels like righteousness has become a dirty word uh, in, our, in our culture. It has, has righteousness become something that is, is distasteful to you? Uh, Jesus told a, a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector who were praying. And the Pharisee proudly play, prays, thank you, Lord, that I am not like that dirty sinner. Instead, Jesus holds up as an example the repentant, contrite heart of the tax collector. But I think far too often we miss the point. We miss the point of confession and repentance. And instead, we stand and proudly pray, thank you, Lord, that I'm not overly religious. Thank you that I don't think I'm perfect like that disgusting guy over there. Thank you for my little bit of sin that keeps me relatable. What, what are we doing when we boast in these things? That is not bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, I think we do this for two reasons. One, I, I think we genuinely detest hypocrisy, and, and Jesus did too. But unfortunately, in our revolt against hypocrisy, we also take self, we take self-righteousness and this holier-than-thou legalism, and we mistakenly lump all righteousness and holiness into that same loaf. As we we hate self-righteousness, we we grow to detest all righteousness, which is a very different thing. But I think the second reason is that, to be completely honest, we, we just love our, our sin. Plain and simple, we love our sin. Our hearts are not truly confessing and repentant. We have corners of our heart that we resist putting to death. And we comfort ourselves that as long as we don't pretend to be perfect, uh, at least we're not being hypocrites which in reality makes us more like the Pharisee than the tax collector in the parable. We're comforting ourselves by comparing us with someone else's sin and saying, at least I'm not that. We figure, hey, look, I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm not pretending to be perfect. Um, so I'm not a hypocrite. So I will, I will just kind of keep and shelter and continue in my own sin. And we end up in the long run boasting in our sin. Your father has invited you into a life of righteousness and holiness. It is not for sin that Christ set you free. So confess your sins and bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Pursue righteousness. It is a worthy pursuit because confessing repentant hearts bear fruit. Uh, so find ways to lean in to confession and to repentance because uh, John has come in announcing the kingdom. Uh, its arrival is a treasure to cherish. It's like the birth of a newborn baby, uh, but its arrival, like a newborn, is going to change your life in ways that you are not ready for. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, so don't presume. Repent, uh, and let us embrace this king and his kingdom as we bear fruit in keeping with repentance.